Welcome to Family History Mysteries, a podcast that tells the stories uncovered through family history research, the unexpected stories of everyday people. I am an avid family historian who has been compiling my family tree for over 15 years, with nearly 20,000 people recorded in my trees. Episode 20 1 in 799 Part 2 The Story of Nathaniel Lucas and Olivia Gascoigne's Descendants If you haven't listened to part one of episode 21, I highly suggest that you start with part one first so you have an understanding of the background of their story. Nathaniel and Olivia left behind a large family of children and grandchildren and I'm going to cover each child and how they fared after the foundations that their parents laid for them. The first child, Anne, was born on Norfolk Island on the 2nd of March, 1779. She married Charles Williams at St Philip's Church in Sydney on December the 1st, 1807, when she was 18. They were married by Reverend Harry Fulton, a celebrant, who had also been a convict at Norfolk Island. Both left their mark as signatures. Charles Williams was born in about 1770 in England and he was a convict. He was convicted on the 9th of March 1793 at Lincolnshire Assizes for stealing and driving away a chestnut gilding, the property of John Hutchinson. The sentence initially was death, but was commuted to 14 years transportation, and he arrived in Sydney on the Ganges on the 2nd of June 1797. In about 1818, Charles and Anne moved to Launceston, as they appear on the musters in 1919. Anne acquired her own land grant on the southern side of the Tamar River, north of the settlement. When her mother Olivia obtained her own land grant, she entered into an arrangement with Anne, making her a tenant in common. Upon Olivia's death, the land passed on to Anne, and she sold it in 1836 and distributed the proceeds amongst the family. Anne and Charles had 11 children, all surviving infancy. Somewhere between 1832 and 1836, Charles Williams disappears, and it's believed that he was murdered. Oral history says that he was murdered at the Pine Mount Bridge, Sydney, by Aboriginals or by convicts. This cannot be backed up by evidence of his death, though. By 1836, Anne had formed a relationship with Thomas Farrow, who she later married on the 22nd of April 1840 at the Independent Chapel in Tamar Street, Launceston, when she was 51. Anne gave her age as 30 and Thomas as 40, but he would have been at least 55. The witnesses were Anne's brother James Lucas and his wife Elizabeth. They had previously had a daughter, Frances, who was born on the 25th of August 1837 and she was baptised at Longford, Tasmania on the 21st of October 1838. Thomas Farrow was a baker when their daughter was born and he was also the publican of the Half Moon Hotel in George Street, Launceston at the time of their marriage. Thomas, spelt F-A-R-R-O-W or alternatively F-A-R-O, was also a convict who was tried at the Lenten Assizes in Chelmsford, Essex on the 12th of March 1801 for stealing a horse. He was sentenced to death but received the royal mercy and was sentenced to life on condition that he be transported to the east coast of New South Wales or another adjacent island. Thomas arrived in Sydney on the Perseus on the 4th of August 1802. He was in Port Dalrymple, which is now known as Launceston, by 1809. He was granted a conditional pardon in October 1810 and married Anne Cossens on the 18th of March 1811. Anne Cossens died of senility aged 66 on the 28th of January 1840 and this was the reason why Anne Lucas and Thomas Farrow were not married until after their daughter was born. In 1840 they made seven trips between Port Phillip and Launceston and by the 26th of October of that year they left Tamar with three children, Maria, Thomas and Frances, bound for Melbourne. Maria and Thomas being the younger two children of Anne and Charles Williams. 
They lived in Lonsdale Street for a year until they moved to Portland, which was then known as Portland Bay. The journey took three weeks. In 1842, Thomas partnered with William Millard to purchase a depasturing licence for 640 acres at Lower Surrey River, which is now Narrawong. It was a very successful venture. The Farrow family then obtained a property known as Darlots Creek and ran a dairy farm. A nearby creek was named Farrow's Creek. In about 1848, the family moved to the Yangri Farnham area near Port Ferry and farmed until Thomas's death in 1859 at Pernham near Warrnambool. His occupation at the time of his death was a baker. Daughter Frances married Edward Manson. He went to the Otago, New Zealand goldfields. Anne and Frances moved to New Zealand on the 22nd of September 1862 and arrived in Port Chalmers, now known as Dunedin, and Anne died at Dunedin on the 15th of July, 1864, aged 77. Charles Williams, who was Charles and Anne's first child, was born in Sydney in 1808. He was baptised at St Philip's Church of England. He moved to the Launceston area of Tasmania with his parents and family by about 1819. This can be established from the returns of the children's census, of 1819 and 1829, which show that the family was in that area. An examination of births, deaths and marriage records for Tasmania up until the early 1830s produces evidence for only two Charles Williamses in the north of the state, these being father and son. Further, the same records failed to yield a record for a marriage for Charles Jr., although there is a death for a Charles Williams aged 20, registered at Launceston in 1829. This registration is in fact for Charles Williams Jr. and normally having buried him, nothing further would have been done regarding his background except for a chance find in the Tasmanian State Archives. During research to try and establish the death of Charles Sr., a reference was located in the archives for a Charles Williams who was hung as a criminal. Further investigation turned up a series of facts that led to the conclusion that the criminal was in fact the son of Charles and Anne Williams. The Hobart Town Courier reported in its issue on the 3rd of January 1829 on a sitting of the courts at Launceston in the previous week. At that sitting was charged one Charles Williams. He was accused of having gone on the 20th of December 1828 in disguise with two other men to rob the house of Mr Griffiths located on the banks of the Tamar River. They stole 40 shillings and put Mr Griffiths in bodily fear of his life. Charles Williams was the only one captured at the time. He was described as being quite a youth, not more than 17. Allowing for some latitude in guessing a person's age simply by looking at them, this fits with Charles Williams Jr's true age of 20 years. Following the court sitting, Charles Williams was convicted and on the 26th of January 1829, he was sentenced by Chief Justice to be hung. The sentence was carried out on the 16th of February 1829. What his grandmother Olivia Lucas thought of this can only be imagined. Having served their sentences, she and Nathaniel worked hard to ensure that their descendants had a better life, attempting to hide or at least lessen the effect of a convict past. Now here was Olivia's first grandchild, being hung as a criminal. Moving on to the second child, William. William Nathaniel John Lucas was Nathaniel and Olivia's fourth child. He was born William Gaskins on the 7th of July 1792 on Norfolk Island. His name reverted to William Nathaniel Lucas administratively on his transfer to Sydney in 1805. William could not read nor write and in 1824, William gave evidence to a judicial inquiry into an incident at New Norfolk, Van Diemen's Land, in which a number of bushrangers raided the homestead of the McCarthy family, whom William had known on Norfolk Island, and had been visiting at the time. An ex marked his statement. This is consistent too with his marriage registration. However, he was a skilled tradesman. In particular, he was recorded as a boat builder in his early years, and it appears that his father taught him the art of carpentry, along with his brothers, and it included boat building and skills passed on. In 1810, he took over the lease of the Trafalgar Hotel from his father. He married Sarah Squire on the 1st of May 1812 at St Philip's Church of England in Sydney. 
Sarah was the daughter of First Fleeter James Squire, who had arrived in 1788 on the Charlotte. James Squire was a brewer and a businessman, and in 1804, James Squire brewed the first beer in Australia. From being a convict on the First Fleet, Squire turned his life around and rose to become one of the Governor's Guards, the father of 11 children, and perhaps most significantly, the colony's first and most sought-after brewer. James Squire was born in 1754 in Kingston-on-Thames. At the age of just 20, he was arrested for highway robbery. Though sentenced to be transported to America for seven years, James instead elected to serve in the army, the first of many shrewd decisions to come, and so was able to return to Kingston just two years later. A romantic at heart, in 1776 he married his childhood sweetheart, Martha Quinton, and they had three children. At the time he managed a hotel frequented by highway robbers and smugglers in the rather aptly named Heathen Street. Perhaps he was unduly influenced by his customers because at the age of 30, James stole five hens and four cocks from his neighbour's yard, and yet again he was caught by the local police. If stealing is an art, it's one that James was yet to master, because on the 11th of April 1785, the British government chose to include him in the transported convict program. He was sentenced to two years in Southwark Jail, and was then to join the First Fleet to Australia in April 1787. A year after his arrival at Port Jackson, Squire was hauled before the magistrate charged with stealing medicines from the hospital stores where he was working. Before you judge his crime too harshly, though, these medicines were a pound of pepper and whorehound, a herb that imitates the tangy flavour of hops. Though James claimed the stolen herb was for his pregnant girlfriend, he later revealed that he had been brewing beer since arriving in Australia. James's beer was already proving popular with the British officers, and no doubt his cunning and charm resulted in a relatively lenient subsequent sentence. Rather than facing execution, he was fined five pounds and sentenced to receive 300 lashes. 150 now, and the remainder when you're able to bear it, according to the order of the 14th of November 1789. In 1791, James began another relationship, this time with Elizabeth Mason, and together they had seven children, and Elizabeth is Sarah's mother. On the 22nd of July 1795, James, by now a free man, was granted a 30-acre plot. But noticing that other emancipists had not claimed the nearby land entitled to them, the enterprising rogue claimed their land grants, purchasing each property for just one shilling apiece. Thanks to such crafty opportunism, James had built up an estate of 1,000 acres by 1806. At the start of the 19th century, the revelation that the British army was trafficking in rum caused uproar in the fledgling colony. Governor Philip King was concerned about the level of corruption, so he began to officially endorse the brewing of beer. English hops and brewing equipment were regularly transported on convict ships at the government's expense. In fact, the HMS Porpoise that I mentioned earlier delivered an entire cargo of hops to the plant on James's farm. In 1805, James successfully grew the first Australian hop plants. The following summer, he attended Government House with two vines of hops. Governor King was so impressed with their flavour and quality that he ordered a cow to be given to Mr Squire from the government herd. It was in 1806 that James's brewery was built on the shore of Parramatta River at Kissing Point. He opened the Malting Shovel Tavern, almost halfway between Sydney Town and Parramatta, the ideal spot to entice thirsty passengers from their vessels along the busy river thoroughfare. The irony was that James became a district constable. He now acted as a banker and a philanthropist to his poorer acquaintances. Noted colonial artist Joseph Lysett explained, had he not been so generous, James Squire would have been a much wealthier man. On the 16th of May 1822, at the age of 67, James died, and his passing was marked with the biggest funeral ever held in the colony. He was buried in Sydney's Devonshire Street Cemetery, which is now the site of Central Station. And well over 150 years later, the James Squire name and spirit lives on with the James Squire craft beer and cider range. Now back to William and Sarah, James's daughter. Their first son, George, was born at the Trafalgar Hotel, and most probably his eldest daughter, Sarah, was born there too. On the 16th of November 1816, William went to Longford, near present-day Launceston, seeking building contracts. 
He was followed by his brother Nathaniel, then his brother John in 1817, as well as his mother and her remaining children joining them. The boys secured a contract, including building the jail there and a chapel. William purchased 900 acres of land from Robert Campbell and secured a further grant of 100 acres, fronting the South Esk River at its junction with the Meander River, south of Launceston, where the family grew wheat and some barley for the Squire Brewery. Originally, the family shipped the grain to New South Wales on ships owned by their former neighbours in Sydney, John Palmer and Robert Campbell. Some family members returned to Sydney with their cargo from time to time. William and Sarah had another three children while living in Launceston. William, 1819, James Bradford, 1820 and Martha in 1822. In due course, their building business and wheat farming activities failed. William then returned to Sydney aboard the Cutter, the Governor Arthur, in July 1826. William and John recommenced business in Liverpool as builders and won a contract to build the courthouse there in early 1827. Not long after commencing construction, their business failed again. Meanwhile, Sarah and her four surviving children returned to Liverpool, travelling to Sydney aboard the Hetty. When the business failed, William got a job as a storekeeper, and in September 1827, William and Sarah had another son, Nathaniel. William's business failures persisted throughout the first half of 1828. In the Sydney Gazette of the 30th of May 1828, Richard Guys published a notice which mentioned that William had surreptitiously obtained notes from him and cautioned the public against negotiating them. He repeated the notice in the edition on the 4th of June. In July 1828, William was aboard a ship on Sydney Harbour. He was either knocked out or fell overboard while the ship passed Parsley Bay. His body was not recovered. There were suspicious circumstances surrounding his death, but no records of an inquest have been found. There is some speculation that while inebriated at a popular Sydney hotel, possibly the Orient, he was shanghaied by sailors. It is reported that upon coming to the ship, it was on its way out to the harbour. When William discovered his situation, he struggled violently with the ship's master, was knocked down and duly deposited over the side of the ship. And there was an article on July 31st, 1828, $20 reward. Whereas Mr. William Lucas of Liverpool has been for some days missing from his home, and whereas there is serious reason to apprehend that per personal violence has been offered him, to ascertain the truth of which, his friends are in the utmost anxiety to learn. Undersigned as his relative, hereby offers the above reward of $20 to such personal persons as shall give information of the said William Lucas, and it's signed by his brother John Lucas. William's poor business sense and early death rendered his family destitute. By the end of 1828, his son George had been left to his own resources, staying with his grandmother Olivia Lucas, whilst his daughter Martha and another son James were placed in the orphanage at Cabramatta. Sarah married an assigned convict Charles Turtle on the 23rd of November 1839 at the Scots Presbyterian Church in Sydney. She went on to have eight children with him, so Sarah Squire actually had 15 children in all. The next child, Nathaniel. Nathaniel Lucas was registered as Nathaniel Gaskins when he was born on Norfolk Island on the 1st of August 1793. When the family moved to Sydney in 1805, he worked with his father as a carpenter and he lived in a de facto relationship with Sarah Stone, who was a convict that had arrived in Sydney in 1812. A little bit about Sarah's conviction. Sarah was tried and convicted at the Old Bailey on the 10th of July 1811 for theft and the Old Bailey trial transcript reads, Sarah Wise, Hannah Levy, Elizabeth Walters, Sarah Atkins and Sarah Stone were indicted for feloniously stealing on the 2nd of July a watch, a metal chain, a gold seal and a gold key, the property of George Hardy from his person. George Hardy states, I am a labourer in the East India Company's warehouse. On July the 2nd, between 1 and 2 in the morning, I met Sarah Stone and Sarah Atkins in Bishopsgate Street, the corner of Sun Street. They asked me to give them something to drink. I went into a court and gave them a glass each of peppermint. I got change for a pound note, ten shillings in silver and the rest in half pence. I put the half pence in my handkerchief. I went with these two prisoners to a room in a court in Angel Alley. 
I got there, they pulled the handkerchief out of my hand, spilt the half pence about the room. In a few minutes, Wise came up. She abused the other two girls for bringing me there, and while she was taking to them, she came up close to me. I perceived my watch go from me. I said, give me that watch again. Then Levy and Walter came in the room. They came between me and Wise. I requested the watch. A man came in and knocked me down. I tried to rescue myself from the man and got him down when the whole of the prisoners pulled me off, beating me at the same time. They got me down and I expected they were going to take my life away. I cried out and begged for mercy. He got up in the meantime and these girls got out of the room. I, being fatigued, got up and instantly he shoved me down the stairs. I waited in the alley nearly three quarters of an hour by the door. Finding nobody came, I thought it was dangerous waiting there any longer. I went towards Bishop's Gate. There I saw the five prisoners coming up the court. I fancy the prisoners saw me. They returned back again and went into a gin shop near Sun Street. I saw the watchman and requested that he would take the whole of them. He informed me he was off duty. I told him I had been robbed and ill-used. He then took them all up to the watch house. They were searched and about seven shillings and odd were found upon them. I had been drinking. I knew what I was about. I am sure that Sarah Atkins and Sarah Stone picked me up and I am sure the other women came to assist them. Benjamin Chapman states, I am a watchman. On Tuesday at four o'clock in the morning, the prosecutor gave me charge of five prisoners. I took them from the wine vaults to the watch house. John Williams deposed, I am a constable. On searching the prisoners, I found Anne Levy one shilling and nine pence farthing, half a crown in silver and the rest in copper. Atkins' defence was, I never saw the man before with my eyes. Stone's defence, the same. Wise's defence, I am innocent. Levy's defence, I went to Spitterfield's market, I could not buy anything. I was returning and I met the other prisoners. We had a quarter and a half of liquor together. Walter's defence, I never saw the man with my eyes. Wise, guilty, aged 18. Levy, guilty, aged 22. Walter, guilty, aged 21. Atkins, guilty, aged 19. Stone, guilty, aged 16. Transported for seven years, London jury before Mr Recorder. Sarah Stone left England on the 4th of June 1812 on the Minstrel and arrived in Sydney on the 25th of October 1812. In 1814, she married Thomas Mason. There are no other records attached to Thomas Mason other than knowing he was a butcher. By 1818, Sarah had reverted to her maiden name and was in a relationship with Nathaniel Lucas Jr. Nathaniel advertised in the Sydney Gazette that he was moving to Port Dalrymple, later known as Launceston, on the 30th of January 1816. Sarah was also listed under her maiden name. Nathaniel commuted between Tasmania and Sydney frequently. On the 27th of September 1819, Nathaniel was granted a licence for grazing at Black Hill in the Port Dalrymple district. Nathaniel and his brother William erected a mill at Launceston. They also entered a contract to enlarge and refit an old building at Launceston for a church and also built the Launceston Jail. It is recorded in some family trees that Nathaniel Edward Lucas was born in August 1832 in Sydney and died in Tasmania in 1915, the son of Nathaniel Lucas and Sarah Stone. However, I cannot substantiate this and in Sarah's inquest papers it state that it is not known of any children born to Nathaniel and Sarah. Sarah died on the 24th of August 1836 at their home in Launceston. The Cornwall Chronicle in Launceston states on the 27th of August 1836. A most melancholy accident happened on Monday night to Mrs Lucas, whose husband had taken a gun charged with buckshot a fortnight previous to fire a salute into the street in honour of His Majesty's birthday. Mrs Lucas was standing in the room. It appears by some accident the piece went off, the contents of which were lodged in the upper part of her thigh. Four medical gentlemen, Doctors Seacom, Pugh, Grant and de Dassel were in immediate attendance and Dr Grant stopped the whole of the night with Mrs Lucas who still lies in a dangerous state. And there's a note after it saying this woman is since dead. The coroner's jury returned a verdict of accidental death. An inquest was carried out. One of the informants was Theophilus Futural Jr otherwise known by his nickname Hobbs from episode 18. 
Hobbs stated that he had known the couple for 16 years. Hobbs recalls Nathaniel Jr. stating to him, Oh my God, what have I done? I have shot my poor wife. Theo saw Sarah with blood running from her left thigh. Hobbs heard Sarah say to her husband, If I die this moment, you are not to blame. The gun not only shot Sarah, but caused her clothes to catch fire, with Nathaniel Jr. immediately extinguishing them. Nathaniel went on to marry Anne Jane Young in Launceston in 1845. Nathaniel died on the 6th of August 1875 at Burgess, Port Sorrel in Tasmania, aged 82, five days after his birthday. The next child, Olivia, was born on the 18th of April 1795 at Norfolk Island. She was the sixth child of Nathaniel and Olivia. She married John Hodgetts on the 8th of April 1811 at St Philip's Church of England in Sydney. They had 14 children, three of which were born in Sydney prior to their move to Van Diemen's Land in 1816. They settled at Launceston, running a farm of 460 acres, which was quite substantial land at the time, and it could have been part of the family enterprise. Olivia died on the 22nd of June, 1851, 20 years prior to her husband. The seventh child of Nathaniel and Olivia, John, he was born on the 21st of December, 1796 at Norfolk Island. He was the first of their children whose birth carried the surname Lucas. He married Mary Rowley, daughter of Captain Thomas Rowley of the New South Wales Rum Corps on the 10th of March, 1817 at St Philip's Church of England, Sydney. And that was the Thomas Rowley that I mentioned in part one in the connections with Olivia Gascoigne and her family. He was a builder and a carpenter by trade who worked with his father from a young age. He also assisted in the milling business and went into shipbuilding. And as I mentioned earlier, he owned the Olivia with his brother and it was wrecked on the southeast coast of New South Wales in 1827. And the details of that wreck I'll read from the Australian on the 14th of December 1827. It's titled Wreck. Some particulars have been furnished as of the wreck of the schooner Olivia belonging to Mr James Lucas. She was bound from Launceston to Sydney and was laden with wheat, coffee and potatoes. Her passage from Launceston was most unfavourable and prolonged beyond anticipation, her water being entirely and her sea stock of provisions nearly consumed. On the 19th the schooner had arrived and was working off the land a short distance to the southward of Twofold Bay when the wind blowing her with violence right upon the shore to leeward she struck the ground. A roaring surf broke over her and there was very little time for the little vessel there was very little time before the little vessel became engulfed in waves. A raft consisting of four water casks lashed together was hastily constructed and on this the people of the schooner committed themselves to the warring elements and by its means all escaped with their lives on shore but they had saved little more of clothes or other property than what they stood in and as of that little they were stripped we were told by the rapacity of the black natives whom they encountered in their journey over land from the shore upon which their vessel lay a wreck to Batemans Bay. The names in the descriptions of the shipwrecked men are John Lucas owner Thomas Hammond Master, John Randall Mate, John Ellis, James Barcourt, John Smith and John French, Seaman, and Francis Ledger Passenger. They were ten days into penetrating through the bush before they arrived at any part of the country inhabited by civilised people. And when they did get to a stock station at Batemans Bay, all hands were in a most miserable plight. Here they were supplied seasonably with provisions, and were able to continue their journey. The owner returned in order to save as much of the wreck as is practicable. It was thought that the wreck had been lost at Twofold Bay, but the natives on whose topographical knowledge, whom they had some reliance on, signified that the wreck did not occur at Twofold Bay, but southward of it. There is also another detailed account of the wreck. Just a note in this account, Aboriginal persons are referred to in a way that we wouldn't find acceptable today. Misfortune again overtook them for the schooner in rough weather went ashore at Twofold Bay and had to be abandoned. The passengers and crew then had to travel over 300 miles of wild country infested with blacks to reach Sydney. 
they took with them a number of beads, pieces of mirror and other trinkets as peace offerings should trouble arise with the blacks. They had not travelled more than 60 miles when they came upon a tribe of some 200 who agreed upon a feast and decided the whites should be killed at the break of day. Fortunately, there was one in the tribe who had dealings with early colonists and had picked up a little broken English. It was he who told the shipwrecked mariners of the verdict of the chief and the sympathies being aroused, he decided to effect an escape for them. Under cover of night, he led them to the river, placed them in a canoe, and they got safely away, reaching Sydney without further mishap. John was declared insolvent in September 1828 and pursued by the audit office of the British government until as late as 1844 for the advance for the Liverpool Courthouse construction. He died at Murren Bateman near Yass on the 5th of June 1875. His son John Jr. became an MP, serving at some time of his political career in Henry Parks's ministry. He was an advocate for free state schools, reformatories for wayward children, trade protection and many other causes. He was one of the first to visit Janolan Caves in 1861 and worked to have them open to the public. One of the largest caverns was named after him, Lucas Heights, and various roads and other areas around New South Wales. And there's an article on the death of John Lucas Jr. Death of Mr John Lucas, MLC. After a comparatively short illness, the death of Honorary John Lucas, MLC, took place at his residence, Bridge Road, Camperdown, on Saturday evening last. Mr Lucas was a native of Sydney, being born at Kingston, now Newtown, on June 24, 1818. His father was John Lucas, miller and contractor, and he was the grandson to the late Captain Rowley, one of the first to enter New South Wales with Imperial troops. Young Lucas received his education in the Church of England School, Liverpool, and at the age of 16 was apprenticed to the trade of carpentry, subsequently becoming a builder and contractor. Among other buildings of public character which he erected was the Roman Catholic School at Burwood. His success in business undertakings enabled him to turn his attention to politics and in 1860 he was elected for Canterbury to the Legislative Assembly and he remained a member of that house for 20 years. He became a Minister for Mines under Sir John Robertson in 1875, retaining that position for two years and ten months. Afterwards, finding that his health could not stand the strain of late hours of the Assembly, he retired and accepted a seat in the Council which he continued to hold until his death. For many years, the deceased gentleman took an active interest in public matters. He was one of the first to visit the Janolan Caves and was so impressed with their value that he induced the government to proclaim a reserve and thus open the caves for the use of the people. He also took a deep interest in educational matters, writing many articles on the subject in the Old Empire newspaper. The water supply of the city was another matter in which he deeply concerned himself his opinion being that it was very questionable whether the Upper Nepean would provide a sufficient supply to meet the demand of a rapidly growing city. The experiences of Sydney this summer give point to that opinion. Mr Lucas strongly advocated what was then known as the George's River Scheme. In politics he was an ardent protectionist. In 1858 he became a magistrate of the Territory and for a number of years sat on the bench at the Central Police Court. His health began to fail some time since, and for the last three weeks, illness confined him to his bed. The immediate cause of death was cardiac debility. He was in the 84th year of his age. The deceased gentleman was a widower, his wife having died about five years ago. He leaves four sons and a daughter, and the interment being made in the family vault at Rookwood. The next child of Nathaniel and Olivia was James Bradford Lucas and he was born on the 23rd of October 1798 at Norfolk Island. He married Elizabeth Murray. They married on the 18th of January 1819 at St John's Church of England in Launceston. He died at Cargnum, west of Ballarat in 1869. They had 17 children. The next child, George, was born on the 8th of May 1800 at Norfolk Island. He married Elizabeth Hodgetts on the 24th of February 1823 in Launceston. They had 12 children. He died on the 23rd of July 1868 at Longford, Tasmania. The next child, Charles. Charles Thomas Lucas was born on the 18th of December 1801 at Norfolk Island. He married Eleanor Ellen Murphy 
a daughter of Michael Murphy and Hannah Williams from episode 7 on the 27th of January 1820 in Launceston. They had 17 children. Charles went on into shipbuilding with his older brother. One of Charles and Eleanor's children, Charles Thomas Lucas, I'll outline some information on him. Mr Charles Thomas Lucas, an old Gippsland identity, passed away at Stradbroke, North Gippsland on Saturday the 16th of February 1918. Associated with whose life is a chain of interesting incidents. He was at the time of his death the oldest Australian native, having been born at Launceston, Tasmania in 1822 and died in his 96th year. His grandfather, Mr Nathaniel Lucas, is stated to have come to Australia by the first fleet of sailing vessels from England and occupied the position of government architect and superintendent of public works. He had seven sons and four daughters, and one son, Charles, born in Sydney, married the daughter of Sergeant Murphy of the 42nd Regiment, and 15 children were born. They lived in Tasmania, and his son, Charles, subject of our notice, was born there in 1822. Misfortune has having overtaken his father as a wheat farmer by reason of floods, having lost 2,000 bushels of wheat, valued at 10 shillings a bushel, he returned with his family to Sydney in 1834 on the boat Olivia, which he and his brothers-in-law built with a cargo of wheat. Reports having reached them of good prospects in Victoria, the family started overland to Omeo, Gippsland, and eventually drifted to Yarram, settling on the Tarra Creek. Mr Lucas, father of the deceased, acquired 115 acres of land on which the old flour mill was built and also 150 acres on the opposite side. The mill was worked by a water wheel. Several hundred pounds was spent on the mill and Mr Lucas supplied flour to the store he started at Russell's Creek. Things did not prosper, however, and the mill was mortgaged to Mr Turnbull, Port Albert, and finally lost. He took ill and died a cascade. The store at Russell's Creek was afterwards sold by his son Joseph for 40 bushels of wheat. The deceased Mr Charles Thomas married Miss Martin, daughter of Captain Martin, in 1856 at Bruthen Creek, South Gippsland, and had three sons and five daughters. They went to Yarram and he engaged building the water wheels at his father's mill. He afterwards settled at Stradbroke, where he lived the rest of his life. His wife died some years ago. The funeral on Sunday was attended by a large number of relatives and friends, the remains being interred in the Sale Cemetery. Mrs H.B. Newton of Elberton is a daughter of the deceased, and Mr Goldie Gabbett, who recently returned from the war, married one of his daughters. Charles Senior died in February 1862 near Bansdale in the Gippsland area of Victoria. The next child, Sarah, was born on the 7th of December 1903 at Norfolk Island and this was compiled by Betty Tabor from material supplied by Russell Barton and Brian Hortle. Sarah Lucas was born on the 7th of December 1903 at Norfolk Island. Sarah Lucas was the 11th child of Nathaniel and Olivia Lucas. Sarah was baptised at Norfolk Island on the 28th of February 1805, just before leaving the island the officiating clergyman being Henry Fulton. She was the second daughter to be called Sarah, the first one being one of the twins that was killed by the falling tree. Sarah moved with her parents from Norfolk Island in the first evacuation and arrived in Sydney on the 11th of March 1805 on the investigator. She lived with her parents at Sydney and Liverpool until 1817 when her mother Olivia took all the younger children with her to Launceston and Sarah remained in Van Diemen's land for the rest of her life. On the 27th of January 1820, she married James Hortle by bands and licence at St John's Church, Launceston. James, the son of James Senior and Anne Hortle, was born at Sydney on the 1st of November 1799. James and Anne with their family had arrived at Van Diemen's Land in 1804, Lieutenant Governor Patterson, and became one of the founders of Port Dalrymple. He was given a tract of land and then went west to the Tamar, where he was speared four years later. In 1814, James Jr. received a grant of 50 acres in the Lake River, Norfolk Plains, and in 1816, he received a further 200 acres. In 1821, 350 acres, and in 1820, he leased pasture from the government. James joined the police force early and became a division constable for Norfolk Plains, both east and west. 
He's like River Grand being in the east and Lady Grant's in the west. During the early 1820s, he lived with his family on Clombies Brook West and up to 1829 when he was appointed Chief District Constable with headquarters in the eastern and more populous part. In 1830, he exchanged his western farm for Inglewood near Longford, where he lived apparently until his death. He held office as Inspector of Stock in 1836, in addition to his police duties. It will be seen by this short history that Sarah and James were becoming more affluent and had a busy life. Sarah and James had seven children during the 19 years they were married. They were mostly born in the vicinity of Norfolk Plains, which is now Longford. Sarah died on the 26th of June 1839 at the age of only 35 years and she was buried at Christchurch Longford on the 29th of June 1839. James then went on to marry Anne Brumby, nee Mansfield, on the 24th of September 1854 at Christchurch Longford and there were no children from this marriage. The children of Sarah and James Hortle were Thomas, Henry, John, William, Anne, Charles and James. The next child was Mary Ann Lucas and Mary Ann was born on the 23rd of December in 1805 in Sydney and she was baptised on Christmas Day in 1813 at St Philip's Church of England in Sydney. She was the 12th of the 13 children born to Nathaniel and Olivia Lucas and as with her sister Sarah, she was called Mary after one of the twins that had been killed by the falling tree on Norfolk Island. She lived in Sydney with her parents and the family moved to Liverpool and then Olivia took her younger children, which included Mary Ann to Van Diemen's Land. Mary Ann married Samuel Cox, another Norfolk Islander, on the 6th of August 1822 at Longford. They had 14 children, all born at Norfolk Plains. The five oldest children were baptised at St John's Launceston and the seven youngest were baptised at the Christ Church Longford after the church was built. Mary Ann and Samuel lived in the vicinity of Norfolk Plains all their married lives and Mary Ann died on the 14th of February 1853 at Longford and is buried at the Christ Church at Longford. She only outlived her husband Samuel by four days. He died on the 10th of February 1853. And the last child, the youngest child of Nathaniel and Olivia Lucas was Thomas and he was born in Sydney on the 17th of November 1807. He married Margaret Sides at St John's Anglican Church in Launceston in 1830. Margaret Sides was also the child of two convicts and she was the half-sister of Elizabeth Murray who Thomas's brother James had married. They came to Victoria in approximately 1839 with their first five children they moved to Geelong in 1840, where Thomas worked as a builder. They went on to have a total of 15 children, and Thomas died in April 1888 in Geelong. About 400 people met at a family reunion held at the Old Mint in Sydney in January 1988. A conservative estimate suggests that there are at least 35,000 people living in Australia who are descended from these two First Fleet convicts. No wonder many, many people can link their family roots to Nathaniel Lucas and Olivia Gascoigne. Most lived until an old age and on average, the first generation had at least 10 children each. Nathaniel and Olivia, who despite their mode of arrival in this country, appear to have played a considerable part in the development of this country. I hope you enjoyed the story of Nathaniel and Olivia Lucas. Certainly many ups and downs. If you are interested in sharing your story on my podcast, Family History Mysteries, please go to my Facebook page and send me a message. If you would like some assistance in filling in the gaps in your family tree to see what mysteries you solve, please get in touch. And don't forget you can have early access to episodes by subscribing and you'll also gain access to bonus episodes.